Okay, uh, welcome to lecture. Sorry about that. Computer problems here. All right. So, all right. So I think we're here. I think you can see. Hopefully. <laughs> all right. We're going to uh, start with uh, chapter eight, which is gases. <clears throat> um, if you have a question on that, I could ask, answer it afterwards on study assignment at the end. All right, so, uh, all right, so hope we can see that. Everything looks good, hopefully. All right, so uh, we're going to roll into uh, gases, uh, chapter eight here. Uh, again, the handout should be up there. All right, let's get going on that there. So obviously at this point, we're gonna talk about gases. Uh, gases obviously are a state of matter that is uh, obviously completely apart from each other. So we have our solid, which is really close to each other. We have our, our liquid, which is also really close to each other. But obviously when we get to the gas stage, we got everybody that's basically flying around pretty free from each other. As they're flying around, as we'll talk about obviously in this chapter, that's what accounts for the pressure that we uh, sort of see or associate with it. Um, so when we talk about sort of gases and we talk about conditions that are sort of normal conditions, everyday sort of conditions, uh, we usually we talk about pressures that are one atmosphere. So an ATM is a unit of pressure, which is known as an atmosphere here. I'll go on that. Interesting stuff, all right. Um, <clears throat> and 25 degrees uh, Celsius is sort of normal uh, temperature. Uh, that we usually think about things. So sort of standard conditions, not, I don't wanna say standard, it's not the right word here, but a kind of normal everyday conditions, 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere for the pressure. Now, uh, ionic compounds under these sort of normal conditions, everyday conditions don't really exist as ionic compounds. Uh, they don't really exist as gases. Uh, so for example, if you take something like sodium chloride, uh, we don't usually find it as a gas under normal conditions. And that's because as we talked a little bit about, ionic compounds are held together through electrostatic attraction. So that positive negative attraction, which is a very strong intramolecular force, holds those things together really tight. So for the most part, under normal conditions, uh, you won't find an ionic compound in the sort of the gas phase. Uh, typically what happened, for example, if you start heating it, so for example, if you took some salt water or something like that that has sodium chloride in it, and you heated it, the water would evaporate off, but eventually the uh, solid there would typically just start to melt because it takes an enormous amount of pressure to try to get those ions away from each other or to separate from each other, which is essentially what you would have to do uh, to get it to go sort of into the gas phase. And under normal conditions, that usually doesn't happen. So when we talk about something like covalent compounds or molecular compounds, 
that's a little bit different. So there are molecular compounds. And again, molecular compounds being guys that are basically held together by sharing of electrons. Um, a lot of those are gases, sort of how they naturally come. So things like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, hydrogen chloride gas, ammonia, and methane there are typically gases at normal sort of temperatures and pressures. But a majority of molecular compounds are liquids and solids at room temperature, but really where they sort of differ from ionic compounds is the fact that they can much easier be converted into a gas than say an ionic compound. So the pretty easy example, the common example is something like water, right? If we have water under normal conditions, it's a liquid, but as we will talk about a little bit more in a later chapter as well, one water uh, held together with another water. And we can very easily heat it to its boiling point, break that bond between the say the two water molecules, and they will go into the gas phase and create something like steam. Um, so the general rule is the stronger the attracted forces sort of between molecules, so for example, the stronger attractive force between like, one molecule and another, the less likely that it will exist as a gas under normal conditions, kind of the weaker that attraction between uh, different um, molecules, you know, less the easier it is to get something to go into the gas phase. Now, some substances that do exist as gases under normal conditions, uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, fluorine, uh, chlorine. So a lot of our diatomic molecules, which are our elements that we talked about uh, previously as well, uh, they exist as gases. Uh, ozone, which is O3, uh, exists as a gas. And then obviously group eight on the periodic table are noble gases. They exist, are helium, or neon, or argon, and are krypton. Uh, they are monoatomic gases, uh, which means they come as ones, which is different than say something like uh, H2, N2, O2, which are diatomic molecules, which basically comes as twos, as how they are naturally basically found. And on periodic table, guys here in blue are essentially your guys that normally come as sort of gases in the sort of natural states or normal conditions. Now, gases, on the other hand, uh, they typically assume the volume and shape of the container they're in. Again, as the gases are basically flying around, they are kind of uniformly filling whatever container they're in. So for example, like this volumetric flask over here, the gas in there is basically pretty much uniformly filling that container. Um, and obviously by default, sort of taking the shape of it as well. Uh, gases are most compressible state of matter. Um, Gases will mix evenly when they're combined in the same container. So just by the process of them flying around, typically gases and gases are soluble in each other because they're flying around, they're mixing with each other in the same container. Something a little bit different about gases, which we'll also talk about in this chapter, is when we calculate something like density, uh, they might have a much lower density. So typically when we think about density of solids and liquids, we think about it in terms of grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, when we think about density of gases, grams per liter is a very common unit of density that we associate with gases, again, because they're a little bit smaller. So uh, we use a bigger sort of volume, if you will, when we express it. Now, obviously, one very important characteristic of gases is pressure. Pressure is force over area. And there's some important units of pressure. And one way that we do measure pressure a lot of times is through the use of a barometer, which is this guy. And older barometers or historic sort of barometers used to have a pool of mercury down here and this sort of glass tube that the mercury sits in. And as atmospheric pressure, as you can see here, sort of exerts on the mercury, the mercury in the tube rises. And you basically can take a reading uh, to see basically what the pressure would be. Uh, so some common units here, uh, one Pascal, PA, is a Newton meter squared. These guys right here are the ones that you probably are familiar with and still probably the most common units of pressure. Uh, that's one ATM, which is an atmosphere. 
MMHG, that is millimeters of mercury. And that's because when you take something like a barometer, we have mercury. And a lot of times there's a ruler sitting here on the glass tube. And basically you can read it like a ruler. A lot of times it's in inches, sometimes it's in millimeters. And that's why the common unit is millimeters of mercury. And 760 Tor, Tor is named after the guy who invented the barometer, Torricelli and it's also 760. So this conversion factor with the 760, it's an important conversion factor. So if you have atmospheres and you want tor or millimeters of mercury, you basically are gonna multiply by 760. That gives you millimeters of mercury or tor. And that's because a millimeter of mercury is the same as a tor. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship between those two. Uh, and then opposite of that, obviously, if you had a tor or a millimeter of mercury, you would divide by the 760 to get to atmospheres. So 760 is sort of your important number there, probably the one you'll use a lot. Um, an atmosphere is also 101,000 pascals or 101.3 kilopascals, which is another common unit. Uh, PSI, which is pounds per square inch, another very common unit, 14.7. Uh, PSI there, I think, per atmosphere. Uh, other units of pressure you sometimes will come across as a bar. It's another unit of pressure, and a bar is one uh, atmosphere is like 1.01 bar. They're very close to each other, so that's another very common uh, sort of unit. So, uh, atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, and tor, I would say, still the three probably most common ones you'll come across. But, you know, there is a wide variety of sort of units. Definitely for our class, like normal atmospheres, millimeters, mercury, and tor, and how to convert between them, you do need to do that. I, I think they will be given to you probably on the uh, conversion sheet. All right, so obviously as we uh, sort of go up away from sea level, uh, the pressure changes. So as you can see, as we continue upwards, there for miles, 10 miles, the pressure sort of decreases, right? While on planes, they get pressurized and all that good stuff, right? When you're flying around, because you're obviously above sea level there. A couple of ways that we can monitor uh, mon a, a pressure of a gas is through the use of a monometer. And there's a couple of ones here. This isn't a vacuum. So the deal is with this guy is the top is closed, right? So. The way we do this is this gas basically is generated here. The gas comes through the tube and it basically pushes the mercury, right? And eventually the mercury will stop basically rising. And if you take basically the height of the mercury in the column, as you can see here to here, that will give you the pressure of the gas. It'll be equal to the pressure of the mercury in the column. Now, you could also do this in the same sort of setup, except that this is a open sort of system, which means that it, the atmospheric pressure can basically exert itself back going the other way. So you do the same thing, you'd measure the height of the, of the mercury, but unlike on the case on the left where it's in a vacuum and there's no effect of the atmospheric pressure affecting it, we do have to add in basically the atmospheric pressure here as you can see here, uh, to get the pressure of the gas. Again, the atmospheric pressure is going to push back down on it a little bit, uh, so it may not rise as much as it normally would without it uh, having that effect. So these are very common apparatuses that were used to uh, study sort of relationships with gases. And when we talk about relationships with gases, there's really three sort of variables we deal with. There's P, which is obviously pressure. There's V, which is volume. There's T, which is temperature. And when we sort of look at these gases and sort of gas laws and relationships, uh, you know, a lot of times we will keep uh, one of these guys sort of constant and vary some of the other ones. And we could sort of develop some relationships that we see. And the first sort of relationship we're going to look at is pressure and volume. And we're going to keep temperature constant. And if we look at sort of these sort of apparatuses here to uh, measure pressure, what we see is this is our gas here. 
So we have 100 milliliters of gas, and obviously our, our volume is our pressure is over here in terms of the height of the column. As the volume starts to decrease, we can see a big rise here occurring in the pressure. So this relationship, as we will see, is really what is known as sometimes Boyle's Law. And basically the relationship is opposite of each other. So as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down and vice versa, the pressure will decrease as the volume increases at constant temperature. And it makes sense if you just think about gas molecules, if the volume gets smaller, everybody's in a much smaller location, they're flying around, which means the rates of collision should increase, rates of collision should increase, which means the pressure will increase. And that's opposite when the volume gets larger. If the volume gets larger, then there's a lot more room for everybody to fly around, which means the rates of collision will start to decrease, less collisions, less pressure. And thus, that's what we see here in terms of this relationship. And if you graph that, what we see here is pressure versus volume is uh, again, at smaller volumes, we have a much higher pressure than as the volume starts to increase, we get a much lower pressure that occurs. And again, you get that inverse relationship here, which gives you a nice linear uh, sort of fit. And this is Boyle's Law. So Boyle's Law is basically P1V1 equals P2V2, sort of a before and after set of conditions. Um, so typically here, uh, in terms of pressure, it could be any unit you want. The key is obviously you need to have the same pressure unit on both sides. And the same thing with the volume here. Volume could be any volume unit you like, as long as they again are both the same on each side. So Boyle's Law, P1, V1 equals P2, V2, again at constant temperature. And again, the relationship that we saw is as one goes up, the other goes down. It's that inverse relationship that occurs. Any questions on that there? I think you got one. So why don't you take a second here and give it a go. So what you come up with, sample chlorine gas occupies uh, 946 milliliters at 726. Um, what is the pressure if the volume goes to 154? So take a moment or two and see what you come up with. Okay, so let's take a look. So usually in gas problems, it's really good um, to kind of pull out the information. Um, so in this particular case, we definitely have a volume that's 946 milliliters. Uh, we have a pressure that is 726 millimeters of mercury. We're looking for another pressure here and we have a volume of 154. 
So again, you could kind of really see, you know, obviously we've only talked about one sort of gas law at this point, but if you had a choice, you could kind of see P1 V1 equals P2 V2 sort of set up there. Really doesn't matter which ones you label ones and twos, but usually whatever comes first is the ones, whatever comes second is the twos. So in this case, uh, we'd have P1 V1 equals P2 V2. In this case, we're solving for P2, and that would give us P1 V1 over V2. Putting everything in here, we have 726 millimeters of mercury. We have our V1, which is 946 milliliters, divided by our V2, which is 154. Again, the milliliters here will cancel. The only unit we have left is millimeters of mercury, which is good uh, because that is a pressure. So if we do all that, uh, what we got here, 726 times 964 divided by 154. Looks like, uh, what we got here? four five four zero millimeters of mercury in this particular case any questions on that particular one there now we could also think about you know sort of the relationship that we talked about here and for example actually let me try again here it is 946. I think I punched that in wrong, huh? I'll try that again. 726 divided by 154. 4450. Uh, 4460 would be better. I guess punch that in right. There you go. 4460, thank you. Millimeters of mercury. There you go. Close. All right. Any questions on that? That should be better, I hope. All right. 946. I think I punched it in right this time, I hope, just to make sure. I, yeah, all right. Not, 726 times 946 divided by 154. There we go, 4460. All right. <laughs> um, so more importantly, after we get the right number there, we can see sort of our relationship. Uh, our volume went down, right? which means we should expect our pressure to go up and it did obviously go up in that particular case. So that is the right um, sort of way to go. So it's good to know sort of the relationship there in terms of what happens with the gas laws to make sure that, um, you know, your answer does sort of make sense. All right, give another one here to go. Try to punch those right numbers in, and give, see what you come up with here. All right, you got a volume of 0.55 liters, sea level. So see what you come up with. We are looking for a final volume in this case.
Okay, so let's take another look here. So same idea, if we kind of pull out the information, we have a volume that's 0.55 liters. It's at sea level at one atmosphere. Again, that one atmosphere is a pressure. It goes to 6.5 kilometers, which is kind of useless information in terms of this. The pressure is 0 0.4 atmospheres, and we are looking for another volume here. So again, um, pretty much our two pressures, two volumes. So P1, V1 equals P2, V2. Here we're solving for V2 in this case. So V2 would be P1, V1 divided by P2. And again, you could kind of make whichever ones you like, the ones and the twos, as long as you keep the information together. And our P1 would be one atmosphere our V1 would be 0.55 liters divided by 0 0.4 atmospheres. Atmospheres are gonna cancel, gonna leave us liters. And what we get here is, one point three eight. it looks like, 1.38 eight liters in this particular case here. Any questions on that one? Hopefully I hit the right numbers this time. That's good. Uh, in terms of sort of our idea of what's happening here, again, uh, we see our pressure is going down in this case, which means our volume should go up and it did, so that's good as well. So again, a good way to kind of check yourself by understanding those relationships that's happening here with Boyle's Law. Any questions on Boyle's Law? So the next thing we're going to look at is the relationship between volume and temperature and also pressure and temperature, uh, holding obviously the other one sort of constant. So <clears throat> relationship here between volume and temperature, uh, keeping pressure constant. And what we see is that low temperatures, um, as the temperature increases, uh, we do get the volume increasing as well. So at a low temperature, we have this much in terms of volume. When we increase the temperature, obviously you can see the gas has really spread out here in the tube. So the relationship here, which is uh, really Charles' law, as we will see, is basically as the volume goes up, so does the temperature, and vice versa would be the opposite trend there. As one goes up, the other goes down in terms of that. So that brings us to uh, really Charles' law here, and Charles' law is this one here, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And this would be at constant pressure. And what we see if we do sort of a Charles Law plot like what we have here, this is volume on the Y, temperature here on the X. And if you take any gas you like, doesn't matter which one it is, but if you take all those gases and you basically extend their lines all the way back to the temperature axis, what we get is always the same number. It always hits this number right here, which is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. Perhaps you recognize this number. This number is the number that we use to convert temperature into Kelvin. And that is because if we were to convert that into Kelvin, 273.15 degrees Celsius plus 273.15 to convert it into Kelvin, we get zero Kelvin, which is absolute zero. And it was why it used to be called the absolute temperature scale. So what that essentially means in terms of gases is uh, pretty much any gas law that involves temperature it does need to be in Kelvin. So 100%, probably every gas situation that you have, you're using some type of gas law, you do need to convert the temperature into Kelvin. Even on problems where, and this is sometimes happens with people, is uh, 
they're given the temperature in Celsius. They're asked what is the temperature in Celsius as well for the answer. So sometimes people think, oh, well, they gave it to me in Celsius. I want the answer in Celsius. I don't have to do any type of conversion. And you will get the wrong answer. So uh, if they give it to you in Celsius, you need to convert it to Kelvin, put it into the gas law, and then solve for Celsius at the end back from Kelvin. So you got to always sort of do that. So that is Charles' law, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Again, here the relationship is as volume goes up, so does the temperature. And as volume goes down, so does the temperature as well. Now, Guy Lussac's law over here is a similar type of relationship, and that is uh, let's see what I'll do is maybe get rid of that there. And his relationship was basically P one over T one equals P two over T two. And this is at constant volume. And if we think about sort of his relationship there in terms of P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2 at constant volume, we could think about what will probably happen in terms of uh, this relationship is if the temperature increases and the volume remains constant, there's no way for it to go up or down. It's just going to lock right into whatever volume it is. That means as you increase the temperature, the gas molecules are going to be flying around faster. And because the volume won't move, you will expect to see the pressure start to rise. So the relationship that we see with this one is as the pressure goes up, so does the temperature. And vice versa, the pressure will go down as the temperature goes down. And that's really different than Charles' law over here because the way it's able to really maintain constant pressure is as you increase the temperature and those gas molecules start to fly really fast and increase sort of the pressure, to maintain the pressure constant, what happens is the volume actually starts to adjust. So the volume goes up and gives everybody a little bit more room to adjust. And that's how it's able to maintain that constant pressure when we're talking about V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. When we get to sort of Guy Lussac's law, because that volume is locked into place, we're going to see an increase in pressure if we increase the temperature because there's going to be more collisions, less room for everybody to fly around in, and vice versa. If we lower the temperature, they're going to have less collisions, and we will see the pressure drop. And that's also in the Charles Law situation why the pressure can be maintained when you lower the temperature because when you lower the temperature, the volume comes down, which means it's able to maintain the same number of collisions and keep the pressure constant. So those are sort of two versions of, of gas laws which are very similar in sort of how they're um, sort of relate. Um, but again, one deals with a pressure temperature relationship, one deals with a volume temperature relationship. But a key on both of these as well, again, this one like every other gas law also needs to be Kelvin in the temperature as well. All right, so let's take a look at one. So I want you to give that a try. A sample of carbon monoxide occupies 3.2 liters at 125. Uh, what is the temperature? Uh, will the gas be at 1.54? See what you come up with.
Okay, so we want to take kind of the same approach here. Again, if, just in case you're not sure what gas oil you should use, if you pull out the information, we have a volume that's 3.2 liters of a temperature that's 125 degrees Celsius. We are looking for another temperature and we have a volume that's 1.54 liters. Again, you can kind of see Charles law V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. We do need to do a conversion here as we talked about pretty much anytime you got temperature involved, you do need to convert it. So we're gonna add a 273 over here to our temperature, which gives us 398 Kelvin. In this particular case, again, you could call these ones, call these guys twos. And in this case, we would be solving for T2 in this case. And if we solve for T2, basically we need to do a little rearranging in terms of sort of gas laws and equal signs, pretty much, you know, you could cross multiply and divide, but essentially what's happening is uh, everybody ends up in the opposite locations, right? So this guy is at the bottom, so he's gonna go to the other side on top. So T2 will equal V2, T1, V1, basically. So basically what happened is he went this way, this guy went down and he went up. So opposite locations basically are basically we multiplied by T2, we divided by V1 and multiplied by T1 to the other side. So trouble for a lot of people is the rearranging. Uh, so if that is sort of an issue, you wanna make sure you take a little bit of time and figure out how to properly rearrange these equations so that you can do it. So T1 here, we do want to use obviously our Kelvin and our V1 is 3.20 liters. Again, the liters here will cancel, going to give us <clears throat> about 192 in terms of our temperature in this particular case. So again, here we see that our volume went down and that means that our temperature should go down as well. And it did. And obviously if we wanted Celsius, we would subtract 273 from it, which would give us a negative number in that particular case. Any questions on that? All right, you got another one. So why don't you give it a try here? So in the experiment, 452 milliliters of a gas in a light bulb goes from 22 to 187. Uh, what is the final volume? See what you come up with.
Okay, so same approach here. We're gonna pull out the information. So we got volume 452. Uh, it's in a light bulb that's at 22 degrees Celsius. And then it goes to 187 degrees Celsius. And we are looking for final volume. So again, here you can see Charles Law. We do need to do a little bit of conversions here, right? We do gotta convert our temperature like normal. Gotta do some Kelvins on each of those. So that's going to get us uh, 22 and 273. 295 Kelvin and 187 plus uh, 273 gives us 460 Kelvin. So using Charles Law here, we are looking for V2, which means we just need to bring this guy to the opposite location over there, which will give us T2 V1 over T1 equals V2. And put it in our numbers here. So T2 goes on top, so that's gonna be 460. V1 is 452 and our T1 is 295. Kelvin's gonna cancel, gonna leave us milliliters, which is good since we're looking for volume. So it's gonna be 460 times 452 divided by 295. Gives us something like 705 milliliters. And again, we could see here that our temperature went up so we would expect our volume to go up as well. So we started at 452, ended at 705. So that does make sense in terms of what we would expect here. Any questions on that calculation there? All right, one more, I think, to go here on this. So give this one a go. Here we're looking for a final pressure. Uh, an initial pressure of 1.2, and it goes from 18 to 85.
All right. So on this one, again, if we pull up the information, uh, we got at 1.2 atmospheres. So that is a pressure. It's at a temperature of 18 degrees Celsius. It's heated to 85 degrees Celsius. And we're looking for a final volume here, our pressure here. And again, this sort of guy Lusik's law, which is the P, P1, try, P1, T1 equals P2, T2. Again, this being that constant um, volume in this particular case. So uh, we have everything but P2. So we're going to bring T2 to the top. And that will give us uh, T2, P1, T1 equals P2. We do need to do some conversions here. So we do need to convert these guys into Kelvin. Uh, so we're going to add 273 to it. So that's going to give us uh, 291 Kelvin here and 358 Kelvin here. And now putting this stuff in the right spot. So T2 up on top. P1, which is 1.2 atmospheres, divided by 291. Kelvins will cancel. Going to leave us atmospheres and 358 times 1.2 divided by 291. 1.48 atmospheres. And again, we see here that the temperature went up. So we would expect the pressure to go up, which it did here. So again, that all sort of makes sense. Any questions on any of those two gas laws there? V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Again, like I said, for the most part, people will sometimes forget the convert to Kelvin, obviously. And also the rearranging sometimes gets people a little bit of difficulty. So again, if you have trouble with any of that, you do want to take some time and sort of figure out the rearrangement of everything to make sure you got it. All right, continuing on with gas laws here, our good friend Avogadro, you know, he had a number, but you know, he wanted a gas law too, so why not? So there is Avogadro's law and Avogadro, if we think about it right, we think about one mole of something, right? Equals 6.022 times 10 to the 23. So with no surprise here, Avogadro's gas law involves moles. And that's what N stands for. And it is V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. This is that constant, as it says right here, perfect. This is at constant temperature and pressure in this case. So at constant temperature and pressure, this is uh, Avogadro's law, uh, volume V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. So you could use Avogadro's law a couple of different ways. Uh, sometimes it kind of, the idea of Avogadro's law gets used. One way is just like a normal gas law. Obviously you can kind of plug and chug into the formula and solve for either volume or moles or whatever it may be. Another sort of practical application of Avogadro's law is you can use it in sort of stoichiometry problems that involve gases. And you can use it in stoichiometry problems that involve gases. Again, obviously it needs to be gases and it needs to be these conditions here of constant temperature and pressure. So a normal sort of stoichiometry like we've been talking about we take those coefficients, right? And we call them the number of molecules or more so the number of moles of each of those. But the relationship here is sort of as the volume is basically related to the number of moles. So the volume is proportional to the number of moles in this situation that in addition to saying this is three moles of H2, you could say something like this is three liters of H2. And this is one liter of N2 gives you two liters of um, NH3. So because gases, a lot of times when we solve for something like gases, um, we oftentimes are looking for something like a volume of gas. You know, that's usually what we sort of refer to and how many grams of gases or anything like that. So we could kind of do a sort of a mole to mole relationship using volume to volume the exact same way as the coefficients. 
and allow you sort of to solve uh, sort of gas stoichiometry problems, again, especially if it's involving uh, at constant temperature and pressure, um, very similar to how we would do a, a basic stoichiometry problem. So in addition to, like I said, it's kind of plugging and chugging into that formula, you could look at sort of a stoichiometry problem here. And again, this is the key part here, same temperature and pressure, which means temperature and pressure are constant. And really from this particular equation, just like what we do stoichiometry, because these are gases, we could come up with basically a volume to volume relationship. We could say that for every four liters of NH3 we throw in there, we need to put in there five liters of O2. We could say for every four liters of NH3 we put in there, we get four liters of NO out for every five come here, liters of O2 we put in there, we get four liters of NO. For every five liters of O2, we get out six liters of high, uh, water. And we can also do the relationship on the product side, four liters of NO gets us six liters of H2O, assuming that that water is a gas. So for each of these, just like we would do sort of a mole to mole relationship, we can um, do a kind of volume to volume, liter to liter relationship, milliliter to milliliter, whatever it may be. So in this case, if uh, we wanna know how many volumes of NO are obtained from one volume of ammonia. So this is uh, ammonia, this is obviously NO in this case. And what we could do is if we start with one volume of ammonia or one liter of ammonia, we could use that relationship that we find here and use it just like a stoichiometry type of conversion factor, that mole to mole relationship, except again, this is gonna be a volume to volume relationship. The liters of NH3 will cancel and we will end, leave, be left with one liter of NO would be produced in this case. So, you can sort of, this is sort of a practical application of sort of Avogadro's relationship. Again, the specific place where you can use this sort of thing is in a stoichiometry problem that involves gases, but the key is it does need to be a constant temperature and pressure in order for that relationship to work correctly. So um, later on, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, obviously stoichiometry involving gases. This is a way in certain situations that, you know, you can kind of avoid a couple of steps by doing it this way. Um, but again, it does have to be that specific sort of conditions of constant temperature and pressure. Any questions on that there? And obviously, like I said, you could also just, you know, plug into V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2 and solve for any of those just like a normal gas law. So we've seen some gas laws up to this point, just to sort of go through some of the highlights here. Again, uh, with Boyle's law, we saw that under that constant um, <clears throat> temperature conditions, if the volume decreases, then the pressure will increase. Again, as you can see in the picture on the left there, the gas molecules have not a lot of room to fly around in, which means we should expect more collisions occurring. And that's why we do see that increase in pressure as we go to the far right there, as we make it a little bit more in terms of the volume, it does give everybody a little bit more room to fly around with. And also it takes a little bit longer for collisions to occur. And that is why we do see a decrease in pressure. So sort of that opposite relationship, uh, what we see happens with our pressure and volume in sort of Boyle's law. Charles' law and Guy Lucas' law, we sort of saw the relationship that uh, really for both of them, pressure and volume, um, if the uh, volume is decreased, um, we will see um, a much higher pressure. I'm sorry, if the volume is decreased, uh, we will see the, let me say this right here, uh, the pressure at lower temperatures, let me get that right there. So if the volume goes down uh, at lower temperatures, um, they will go down as well together and at higher temperature the volume will increase again to keep the pressure constant so what we see up here is if i could see the little needle there 
if you look at the pressure gauge all the way across here, the pressure doesn't move. So again, in Charles' law, the volume adjusts to allow the pressure to remain constant. And again, in the case when the volume goes down, it allows the collisions to maintain sort of their level and keep the pressure constant. And as the volume increases, which is gonna take um, a little bit longer to kind of come in contact, uh, we'll keep that rate of collisions about the same. Um, when we do uh, sort of uh, look at our pressure and temperature, same sort of relationship as the pressure uh, increases, so does the temperature and vice versa as it goes down, so will the pressure. And that's a situation where the volume will not change. So here you can see in this case, all three volumes are the same. So we don't get that volume adjusting to allow the pressure to maintain the same. So when we increase the temperature and the volume doesn't move, we're gonna have more collisions and more pressure. And when we lower the temperature and that volume doesn't move, we're going to have less collisions and the pressure will start to drop, which is what we see in the pressure gauge. We sort of look at the top part of it. And looking at Avogadro's laws, sort of that relationship between uh, volume and moles. So really as one kind of goes up, the other one goes up sort of proportional to it. And really putting all these gas laws together, Boyle's law, Charles law, Avogadro's law, we get really sort of the granddaddy of them all there, which is the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. And this is our ideal gas law. And right off the bat, you can see it's a little bit different than the others. The ideal gas law is sort of a one set of conditions. Uh, so we don't have sort of a before and after type of situation like we had on those other ones where we had two pressures, two volumes, whatever it may be. Also as well, it is the most restrictive in terms of units. When you use the ideal gas law, the pressure has to be in atmospheres. When you use it, it the volume has to be in liters and should hopefully be in moles or something went really weird. Temperature does need to be in Kelvin. And the reason really all these guys has to be in those units when you use the ideal gas law is because R. R is the gas constant, has a value of 0 0.08206 the units are liters times atmosphere divided by Kelvin times mole. Some people will round this number to 0 0.0821 as well. But since it has all these units, in order for everything to properly cancel out when you use the ideal gas law, that's pretty much all the units everybody else has to have, which makes it really good because if you forget, for example, uh, what units they should be, uh, you basically could look at the R value there and use those units to figure out what everybody else should be in. So this is sort of a one set of conditions, PV equals NRT. A couple other things in terms of the ideal gas law and some relationships is a couple of other important ones. So let's take a look at that. One important relationship is something that's known as STP. So when somebody says STP, what that means is standard temperature and pressure. It actually does have value. So if the problem says it's at STP, what that means is the temperature is 273 Kelvin and the pressure is one atmosphere. So if in problem they say, what is this at STP or you're doing this at STP, they are actually giving you values for temperature and pressure and that's what those values are. Another important relationship or a nice relationship is when you are at STP and only at STP, one mole of any gas will equal 22.414 liters. So the nice thing about this little conversion factor is sometimes it will allow you not to have to use the ideal gas law to solve a problem. You could actually just use that conversion. Um, you could still use obviously the ideal gas law either way. Uh, but the key is you can only use this conversion uh, when it is at STP. So if the pressure is not one atmosphere or the temperature is not 273, you should definitely not use that conversion factor because you will get the wrong answer. But if it is at STP, you can use it. And this is really how we get to the value of R. If we take the ideal gas on a solve for R and put in everybody here at STP conditions, pressure one atmosphere, temperature 273, 22.41 liters and one mole, 
that again is how we get to the value of R in terms of our gas constant. So again, just a reminder that 22.414 is used only for a specific purpose or time when it is STP. Again, not STP, you cannot use that. The good news is you can use the ideal gas law for any set of conditions. So you could always plug things in there. So I would try one here and see what you come up with. Uh, calculate the pressure in atmospheres exerted by 1.82 moles of SF6 gas at a volume of 5.43 and 69.5 degrees Celsius. So take a couple minutes there and see what you come up with. All right, so when we look at something like this, again, <clears throat> if you're not sure, you can pull out some information. Uh, we wanna calculate the pressure. Uh, we have moles, which is N, <clears throat> 1.82 moles. Uh, we have a volume that is 5.43 liters and a temperature that's 69.5 degrees Celsius. So you can kind of almost see the ideal gas law here. Again, we only have one pressure, volume, and temperature, and all that kind of stuff. So PV equals NRT. Uh, like everything else here, we do need to convert to Kelvin for our temperature. So we're going to take uh, 69.5 plus 273. Going to give us 342.5 Kelvin. In this case, we are solving for pressure, so pressure would equal NRT over V. We always have R as a gas constant, so it's always this number. So we have everything that we need, so put it in our moles, which is 1.82, our R 0 0.08206. Our temperature has been converted to Kelvin, all divided by the volume, which was 5.43 liters. Liters will cancel, moles will cancel, Kelvin will cancel. Gonna leave us atmospheres as the only unit left, which is good since we're looking for pressure. That's gonna be 1.82 times 0.8206. Uh, times 342.5 divided by 5.43 gives us 9.42 atmospheres. Any questions on where any numbers came from or any of that there on that problem? Okay. All right, if not, then Give the next one a go. What is the volume occupied by 49.8 grams 
of HCL at STP. Let me give you some numbers that might help you there. So hydrogen is 1.008. Chlorine is 35.45 from the periodic table, gram per mole. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. So we're looking for the volume. Uh, so obviously we are looking for volume. Uh, 49.8 grams of HCl at STP. So remember that when it says STP, that means that the temperature is actually 273 Kelvin. Pressure is actually one atmosphere. Uh, basically is what STP stands for. We, so we have temperature, volume, we don't have moles, but we do have grams, so we really can get to moles from that. So we can, one approach here, use the ideal gas law and solve for volume. So the volume would be NRT over P. We do have to do some conversions here. It looks like our grams to moles. So 49.8 grams of HCl from the molar mass, we essentially just need to add those numbers together and it looks like 3646 is our molar mass there from the periodic table. That's gonna give us uh, 49.8 uh, 49 divided by 3646, 1.37 we'll call it. And now we do have everything that we need. So uh, 1.37 moles uh, are R, which we always have. Our temperature, which is 273 because we're at STP. And our pressure, which would also be one atmosphere because we're at STP, gives us... 30.6 liters. Again, Kelvin would cancel, moles would cancel, and atmospheres would cancel, which would leave us liters. 
Now, that's one way you could use it. As you can see, you could use the ideal gas law. But perhaps some of you remember what we were just talking about, that we are at STP conditions, which means at STP conditions, one mole of any gas will equal 44 point, uh, 20, sorry, 22.414 liters. Get the right numbers here in my head. There we go. And well, that means that once we got to this part here with our moles, we could take 1.37 moles and use this as a conversion factor that one mole is 22.414 liters. And I keep saying 44 for some reason, 22.414. We get something like 30.7 liters. Again, I rounded here on the second one, not the first one, but pretty much the exact same answer. So you can go either way. And again, here, I didn't really round this number. I just used what was in my calculator. So that's the slight difference that you have. But you can use, obviously, as you see that conversion here, because it was STP, um, or you could see if you can't remember that conversion or not sure you should use it, you can still use ideal gas law no matter what. So ideal gas law can use no matter what conditions, STP, non-STP, but remember that this conversion down here is only at STP. So you gotta make sure it is SCP if you choose to use that one. Any questions on that particular one there? Okay, so, so far we've been talking about sort of relationships that involve uh, sort of two variables for the most part and sort of keeping the uh, third variable constant. And there is a relationship that basically deals with all those variables together. So if we actually do take, uh, the ideal gas law, and we solve for R for two different situations. Since R is a constant, we could actually set each of these equal to each other. And we get this relationship here. And in most cases, the number of moles of gas will not change unless you open the lid. So usually these guys are also very constant. And that gets us down to this gas law here, which is P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. And this is what is sometimes referred to as the combined gas law. And this is usually the one that gives people the hardest time is sort of the rearranging of it. Like all our other gas laws, again, our temperature here does need to be in Kelvin on both sides. And again, you wanna make sure you rearrange that. So this is one that relates all three variables together, pressure, temperature, and volume. So as they sort of change, how other ones will change with them. So while we try our rearranging skill on this example here, consider a sample of oxygen gas, 27 degrees at 9.55 and 297 atmospheres. Uh, what is the new volume if we change the pressure and the temperature? Take a minute or two, and we'll finish up with this example here.
Okay, so since we're getting to the end here, let's take a look. Um, again, if we pull off the information, we got a temperature 27 degrees. We have a volume that's 9.55 liters. We have a pressure that is 2.97 atmospheres. Pressure then becomes 8.25. Temperature becomes 125 degrees Celsius, and we're looking for a volume. So hopefully you can kind of see the combined gas law there, P1, V1, T1 equals P2, V2, T2. Again, you could call these guys twos. All these guys ones. Like usual, we need to do a little bit of conversion here. So our temperature is going to become uh, 273 plus or 27, which will give us 300 Kelvin here. And I'll just go down this way. Also 398 Kelvin when we add the 273 to that. In terms of our pressures, they're both in atmosphere, so that's okay. We are solving for V2 which means we need to multiply T2 to the other side. He's going to end up on top. We also need to divide by P2, which he's going to end up on the bottom there. And that's going to give us that V2 is equal to T2 as he comes to the other side, P1, V1, divided by P2 that comes to the other side, and T1. So again, opposite locations as they go across that equal sign. That's going to give us uh, T2, which is uh, 398, again, using our Kelvin. Our P1, which was 297. And our V1, which was 9.55 liters, divided by our P2, which was 8.25 atmospheres, and our T1, which was 300 Kelvin. Kelvin's cancel, atmospheres cancel. Gonna leave us liters, which is good because that's what we're looking for, a volume. And if we do all that, 398 times 2.97 times uh, 9.55 divided by 8.25 and divided by 300 gives us something like 4.56 leaders in this particular case here. Any questions on that there? Next one. And it sort of makes sense as well. Again, uh, we see that the volume went down. And when the volume went down, we would expect as the temperature also went up that those gas molecules should be moving around faster. And we would expect as we see the pressure to go up with that as well. So this all sort of makes sense. Any questions on that one? I'd say this one's probably the one that gives people the hardest time in terms of the rearranging part of it. Again, might want to take some time to make sure you know how to properly rearrange these guys. Any questions on any of that there? Okay, we're going to uh, stop lecture here. Uh, we are starting uh, today, this week, I think, uh, the big actual experiment for the, the class, which is the titration experiment. There's three different parts. So I think we'll focus in probably on the first part today. So we'll talk a little bit about that, some of the calculations that go with that. And other than that, uh, since we ran a little bit long, why don't we start about, we start about 9.50ish or so, is that in that ballpark in the lab? Make sure you type here if you uh, have not done so already. And unless you don't have any questions, I will see you in lab.